Hello everyone, Mr. Waz here and welcome to Wazley Science. Today we're going to be talking about electricity. Now this is a pretty big unit so I'm going to split it into two parts and this is going to be part one. With part one we're going to talk about basic things about electricity, specifically electrons and how, and how they move and why they move. And we're going to talk about current, voltage, and resistance. So let's get started. Let's begin with talking about electric charges. Now you probably are familiar with what an atom looks like. It has a nucleus in the middle and in the middle are the protons and the neutrons. And surrounding the atom are the electrons. Now do you remember which one has the positive and negative and neutral charge? The proton has the positive charge which is in the nucleus nucleus and the neutron has no charge and the electrons have a negative charge and that is really important we're gonna see that throughout this unit so let's take a look now on the left we have here an orange sphere and a red sphere now the orange sphere does not represent a proton but just an object that's positively charged and the red sphere represents another object that's negatively charged. So these two objects would become attracted to one another because one is positively charged and one is negatively charged. Whereas these objects here, the two orange ones, um, both are positively charged so they would repel and these are both negatively charged and they would repel. And this is a very very important concept that relates to why we have electricity. So make sure that you understand this. So why do objects become negatively and positively charged? Well, that all depends on the amount of electrons that they have in comparison to their amount of protons. Now a neutral atom, a neutral atom would have an even amount of protons and electrons. So the protons are positively charged, the electrons are negatively charged. If there's the same amount of them, it has no charge. But these electrons can leave the atom and it can become an ion after that and when an electron leaves an ion leaves an atom it will join another atom and when that happens the atom then becomes positively charged when an electron leaves and then when an electron joins a new atom that atom then becomes negatively charged. So when you gain electrons you become negatively charged and when you lose electrons you become positively charged and that seems kind of weird concept for students a lot because you would think that when you gain something because you become positive because gaining things are good but in this case electrons we're talking about charges here and when you gain electrons you become negatively charged. Um, we'll dem I'll demonstrate the rubbing the balloon on your hair uh, demo in class but I'll just tell you now when you rub a balloon on in your hair what you're doing is you are ripping electrons out of your hair and putting it on the balloon so the balloon becomes negatively charged because it's pulled electrons right out of your hair and your head becomes positively charged now that side of the balloon that you rubbed your hair becomes negatively charged. So one thing that a lot of people don't do that I think is even more fun to do with the balloon is to give the balloon a 180 degree spin and then try to have it attached to your head. It'll bounce right off your head because that other side of the balloon will become positively charged just like your head. And then if you take the other side of the balloon that you rubbed on your head and then stick it to your head, it'll, it'll, it'll stick right to your head. So it's just an interesting thing there. We'll demonstrate that in class, don't worry. So what is an electron? That is a really good question. Um, usually we just think of it very simply in that it's like some ball looking thing that spins around the nucleus. This diagram on the left here is extremely inaccurate of what an atom looks like because what it's showing is you know, the electrons spinning around 
the nucleus on a single orbit. And that's simply not the case for how for what they do or even what they look like. This diagram over on the right that you've seen before is a little bit more accurate, kind of, because it's showing that the electrons all have their own orbits and they're spinning all over the place. The reality is that it's kind of impossible to show what an electron looks like and what it's doing around the nucleus. But what I do have over here is I have a video. It's the first video of an actual electron on a coil of wire essentially and that's kind of what they look like and what they do on a wire that's not necessarily what they do when they're lightning or other things but that's what they look like when they're all lined up on a wire we'll talk about that more but I just thought this was really cool that it's actually a video of an electron and this video over here is another Crash Course episode. Um, it's all about electrons. It's very, very high level and confusing. I've watched it several times and I still don't get a whole chunk of it. But what I'd like you to do is go to, if you click on the link right here, it's gonna automatically bring you to the 10 minute 30, uh, 10 minute 30 second mark. And what it shows is more of what the electron field around the nucleus really looks like and how it does not look like this diagram in the upper left. So we were talking about the rubbing a balloon in your hair example. So let's just go ahead and talk about static electricity. So when two objects rub against each other, um, electrons will transfer and build up on an object causing it to have a different charge from its surrounding and it's usually the object that is doing the rubbing itself that will pull the electrons off so in this diagram a here you can see there's green plus signs and red negative signs so the green plus signs represent protons and the red negative signs represent electrons so if you count them up on the shoe itself you got one two three four five six seven protons and and seven electrons. And um, if you look at diagram B, so this is after the shoe has rubbed on the carpet, if you look at the amount of protons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that's really important because you can see there, you know, when you rub your feet on a carpet, you don't pull protons off, you don't lose protons, protons stay the same. But if you count the amount of electrons that are now on the shoe, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, now there are more electrons on that person's shoe. And now there are less electrons on the carpet. So the carpet is now positively charged because it has more protons than neutrons, and your shoe is negatively charged because it has more electrons than protons. So now that you have some electrons on your shoe, let's continue to walk across the room. Let's say you approach a doorknob and you go to turn it and all of a sudden you feel a big zap. What is that? So what that was, was the electrons that were on your shoe have traveled up your body to your fingertip and took a sort of Dukes of Hazard jump off of your fingertip to the doorknob. That's called an electrical discharge. So the electrical discharge is this area right here where it's taken that sort of jump I was talking about. Um, and that really is what lightning is. And the reason why it does that is because the electrons are attracted to the metal doorknob. It wants to get to anything that's very conductive. So your, your body is conductive, but not nearly as conductive as the doorknob, so that's why it makes its jump. And we're gonna talk more about lightning at the end of this video, so hold tight. So before I mentioned that the doorknob is a conductor. A conductor is a material which allows an electric current to pass. Metals are good conductors of electricity. An insulator is a material which does not allow electricity to pass. Nonmetals are good conductors. So things like plastic, glass, wood, rubbers 
are good insulators. And both of these are extremely important when you have electricity. So one of the, one of the best conductors uh, for metal is copper. Um, even better one is gold, but that's a little bit rare. So copper is a great conductor, and that's what most of our electrical wires are made of. But we also need to trap the electrons on a sort of path. So we'll put plastic around the copper so that the electrons have no choice but to follow along on the copper itself and not onto other things when it comes in contact, like your hand, for example. All right, so now we're going to move on to electric fields. And it'll be a little confusing at first, but bear with me. It'll come together by the time we start talking about circuits. So we have an orange sphere and a red sphere again. And electric fields surround a charge. And um, depending on what charge they have, they will either pull or push on something else on some other charge. So this shows here that the positively charged object is actually pushing out and that the negatively charged object is pulling within. So that's really important because we can use this sort of concept to pass electricity along on a wire. This shows here the sort of electric fields that I'm talking about. So you can see here that these two objects are attracted to one another because this one's pushing and this one is pulling. Again, it's shown here the positively charged object is pushing and this one's pulling, so they're, they're coming together. Here, they're bo both positively charged, so they're actually pushing away from each other. So, it's, so that's just really important to understand that there are fields around these positively and negatively charged objects that we cannot see. So now that we have a little bit basic understanding of why and how electrons work and what they look like, let's talk about how they act in a circuit. They actually act very similar to how water acts if you have water hooked up to a pump in a turbine. So in this diagram on the left here, you can see that water would shoot out of this pump and then move up the pipe through the turbine then back down and it would just sort of repeat that pattern and water wouldn't really be going the other way. So that's actually how electrons sort of work when you have wires hooked up to a battery and a light bulb. So we have the negative side of the battery, the negative terminal, and the positive side, the positive terminal. When electrons approach the negative side, they leave. When they approach the positive side, they enter the battery. Now here's the big deal. Why does it happen that way? Well, as we talked about earlier, negatives, negative and negative will repel, positive and negative will attract. And remember, what kind of charge do electrons have? They have a negative charge. So when electrons approach this side of the battery, they are being repelled away. So they're being launched out of the battery because they have a negative charge, and this side of the battery has a negative charge, so they're being repelled away. And they move their way through the light bulb, and sl they get slowed down from the light bulb because the light bulb is a resistor, which causes the light bulb to turn on. And then as, they're at the, as they are at this point, they begin to feel an attraction. They're feeling an attraction toward the positive terminal of the battery. So that's what brings them back. So there is a force that pushes them away and pulls them back. And that's, what, that's how batteries work. That's why batteries are important for making things turn on. Because they are the force, the driver, that keep the electrons moving. Now, my question to you is how fast exactly is an electron? You're probably thinking it's really fast. I want you right now to watch this video and we'll talk about this video in class but I think you're going to be surprised when you hear how fast an electron moves through a direct circuit. Alright guys, so I'm going to give you three words. They're going to seem very confusing at first 
but I have a great analogy that will put them all together into perspective for you. So our first word is voltage. And the unit of measurement for voltage is volts, or V. And voltage is the electric potential. And what's really important about voltage is you change the amount of voltage you have by adding batteries or adding power, electricity, more juice. Okay, so the more batteries, we'll often use batteries and the examples we'll use in class, the more batteries you have, the higher amount of voltage you have. It's the power, okay? And current is the flow of charges in the circuit. We measure current in amperes and we use the letter I for current. I know it seems weird we don't use C, but we can't use capital C because that's Celsius. We can't use lowercase c because that's the constant for the speed of light. So we have to use another letter, and I guess I was available, so we went for it. Our last word is resistance. Resistance is the opposition to the flow of an electric current it will slow down the electric current and convert it to thermal energy or light. So in this example with the light bulb here, this part of the light bulb is slowing down the movement of electrons which is causing them to heat up and produce light. That's the filament of a light bulb there. And we'll talk more about like what that is and why it does that in class. So the unit of for the unit for measuring resistance is ohms. So it's this crazy looking horseshoe here. So that's probably a new fun symbol for you to draw. And you can change the amount of resistance by having either if you want to add resistance, you make the wire longer and skinnier. And if you want less resistance, you get a thick piece of wire that is shorter. So I know there's tons of videos out there that show what resistance voltage and current is like and I'll show you a couple of them in class but um, this is how I like to think how electricity works so follow along with me I'm sorry I don't have like fancy animations like a lot of these videos do but I'm gonna do my best okay so the first thing we're going to talk about with this bathtub is I want you to pitch this bathtub filling up with water and the drain is open so the, the water's just going down the drain and the water is represented by current we're gonna we're gonna say that the water flowing down is the current so the water's just doing its thing just like current current just does its thing you can't just turn up current current how much current there is is a reaction of the amount of of how you manipulate voltage and resistance so you can't just turn up current you have to do something with the voltage and resistance just like with this bathtub here so if you want more water to flow you have to go up to the faucet and turn up the amount of water so you'll increase the amount of water in the reservoir here which will cause more pressure and cause the water to flow down the drain faster. So when you increase the amount of water in the reservoir, you are increasing voltage. And as a result, you are causing the water to flow faster, which is in a return, increasing the current. Now, the last part here is the resistance. With this bathtub, the resistance could be the drain. You could adjust the size in the length of the drain to change the amount of resistance. And when you change the amount of resistance, it's going to change the amount of the current. So if you want the water to flow faster, you would, of course, make the drain bigger. You would make the diameter of the drain, the drain bigger, which would cause the water to flow down faster. And if you wanted to keep water in the bathtub longer, so if you wanted to slow down that current, you would make the uh, drain smaller, have a smaller diameter and make it longer and that would cause the water to build up. So that's my bathtub analogy for you. I hope it 
helps put these three things into some perspective. All right, guys, so to finish this off, I'm going to show you Ohm's Law. And Ohm's Law is a lot like the density formula that we talked about earlier this year, except instead of density, we have current here. So instead of a D right here, we have an I. And the, so current goes there. So to calculate current, you simply take the voltage and you divide it by the resistance, I equals VR or V equals I times R. So if you want to calculate voltage, you would just multiply the current and the resistance. So in this example here, a toy car with a resistance of two is connected to a three volt battery. How much current? So then you would plug it in the equation, three volts divided by two ohms gives you a current of 1.5 amps. So very simple guys, laid back, uh, formula here and we're gonna practice this of course in class so we are experts. Credits for some of the material on this presentation goes to Mark Richards and the bathtub analogy idea goes to Timothy Kessler. Alright guys so that wraps up part one for electricity please remember to subscribe click on the button here in the top left I have two videos for you and they are on lightning so make sure you click on them if you click on the top right one you can see how lightning works very interesting and I'd like you to answer those two questions on the bottom right and bring them into class also feel free to take a watch of this video on the bottom left it shows lightning striking down on a soccer field and everyone just immediately is an in instant pain. It's really interesting to watch, so make sure you watch that. Alright guys, thanks a lot, and take care.